Hi, uh, welcome to the 8th in our Labor History um, talks. This is about the ALP in the war, Labor in the war, the CPA in the war, the Communist Party of Australia in the war, and the challenge Labor put to Australian capitalism during the war and after the war. Um, this is historical, so we're using historical methodology, which is based on the idea that um, we try and do our best, but we get it wrong, and um, so I may be wrong about this. Uh, I do have more expertise in this period, so I can probably be wrong in an expert way rather than being wrong in an amateur way. Uh, the other thing is, theoretically, I'm looking at this from the perspective of the working class itself, dealing with how we compose ourselves to fight the bosses, how the bosses come back at us and try and decompose our organisation, and then how we react to that and recompose ourselves. Uh, last week we ended on a Labor movement where the Communist Party unions were winning ALP left workers over to an anti-war line in Wollongong, taking on the state in political strikes for peace and winning. The CPA supporting, was supporting a Labor culture where, despite the churn of members in and out of the Communist Party, the party was growing and growing in, as a self-educating movement within an existing quite active labour movement, and the Communist Party supported culture. It was embedded into unions that were deeply democratic compared to today, and the CPA was also at work building social movements, particularly by women members, for peace, equal wages, and for popular culture, which didn't really exist in Australia in any way. Um, this week we looked more at the cooperation of ALP union movement affiliated unions and CLP union movement affiliated unions. Um, which was acting as one union movement in the period, during a period of growth, and then the dissolution of this unity um, just at the moment, as everybody, even the ALP rights, and for the fear of the Catholic labour movement, believed that socialism was actually on the cards in Australia. When the war began in 1939, the Communist Party was following the international line, which was against war. Um, and as a result, they were declared illegal in 1940 after the fall of France. ASIO didn't exist at this time, so it was the post office's secret sections that organised the persecution of the CPA and its presses and its publications and associated movements with the help of state special branches. The CPA did go underground and they moved their presses around regularly and kept publishing illegally, um, and their membership records and guns were, you know, buried and dug up and buried and dug up during the period. Um, the ALP achieved government federally in October 1941 uh, after the Soviet Union was attacked by Nazi <coughs> Germany and the CPA was effectively re-legalised in this period in a de facto sense with ALP to power within a few weeks and in a de jure sense, a legal sense, they were re-legalised in December 1942. The Communist Party rapidly became a great supporter of the war as soon as the Soviet Union was invaded for some reason, and rivalled the ALP with anti-strike positions. The ALP and CPA tried to negotiate with union heads to cut strikes off before they began. Um, yes, they were holding back militancy, but they, they still wanted it to some extent, but they didn't want it to emerge to threaten the war. The Communist Party's membership swelled to between 16 and 20,000 by 44 or 47, it depends. Like, the membership records aren't great and it's a churn party. So people join and then they lapse and join and lapse. Um, the ALP didn't hold back from um, economic development, though. War required mass production. So in the 1930s, there was a situation, 1920s and 1930s, where there was reserves of money capital not being used and excess productive capacity in Australia. And the war soaked up this excess productive capacity really rapidly. The question was, we want useful goods of all sorts suddenly to waste them in a god-awful war, but we want useful goods. And there were problems, in fact, with um, financing this through capital, through loans, through wage restraints. Um, even the US couldn't flood enough capital in Australia into Australia in money terms to keep things going on a private market basis. The ALP government had to organise capitalism better than capitalism could to achieve the war outcomes desired. So they're telling private mining companies that if they don't build a road for war purposes, they're going to get nationalised kind of deal. Um, the other thing which happened for ordinary workers was rents rose and wages did too, but wages rose far slower than the cost of commodities and rents rose. And in military cities like Brisbane or Sydney, where the city is suddenly flooded with American sailors, rents shot up dramatically 
The ALP's response was to introduce elements of social wages, so elements of rent control, not effective, but on the books. But more, more typically, these social wage elements were factory-based occupational health and safety, factory nursing, factory health, factory education, skill improvement programs, all centred on the productive apparatus of capitalism. They organised capitalism better, much like the CPA tried to, even though it wasn't actually in government. And part of this is a, a, it's a fantasy that the world could be reconfigured during and after the war for the ALP through nationally coordinated capitalism that they kind of want to call socialism, but socialism was still a larger dream than the ALP officially wanted. So ALP union members' dreams of socialism were much more grandiose than the ALP's idea of limited nationalisation and state coordination of manufacturing capitalism. The CPA, as soon as the Soviet war broke out in 1941, cemented its position in unions and trades hall as the alternative party of the working class and grew its membership and grew its union influence. Um, some of its white collar members who joined the army, for instance, um, were shunted off into the army education division. So these are CPA teachers joining the army, the army going, fuck no, we don't want lieutenants who are communists, chucking them in army education to teach soldiers how to read. Um, and the CPA positioned itself as the leader of the people's war. So even though the Soviet Union's war was the great patriotic war, the CPA conception of the war was of a people's war, a democratic war, a war against fascism. Um, the war brought thousands of women into work because about 600,000 Australians, including women, were brought into the armed forces and production was increased dramatically. So there was a labour shortage, but the full employment which the war brought, including for women workers, who in some areas like um, metals, I think in iron workers, achieved 90% of the male wage, and the Commonwealth Government went around bashing up employers who failed to pay these rates. Um, the full employment, while it increased militancy, the militancy was being held back by the CPA, by the ALP, by the unions, by the government. Um, the unions grew and the ALP pro-union positions and the CPA sense of militancy, even if not striking, produced strength. And this strength in the unions begat strength. So for the first time, really, we can talk about the dominant labour movement organisation actually being the unions, which it wasn't true in the past to nearly the same extent and certainly wasn't true in earlier episodes. Um, also in this period, white collars solidified unions in their workplaces for the first time. Unions had existed, but they solidified under the war conditions and grew and became legitimate, even if they were viewed as associations. Um, we might talk a bit about some less than nice white collar workplace organisations later in the late 40s tonight. Um, but white collar work, the reason why it was growing was the war. The reason, the way in which it grew was new workers in new industries taking on new jobs on a working class basis. So these weren't the old professional white collar jobs. This is a proletarianisation process just like the factory system where you get in an entirely new working class that reduces the wages and conditions of the previous non-workers in the sector. Um, and they were still better paid than blue collars, straight out. Um, by 1944, mass strikes were breaking out in Australia. The strikes had been growing from 1942. And look, the one I'm most familiar with, to give you a, t a tone and texture of the revolutionary potential that was going on during the war, is the journalists working in Sydney. This is basically where workers take over their workplace and start producing without bosses. Um, for two weeks they published a newspaper of record, the official newspaper that people turned to as a workers' cooperative. This kicked off by women in typesetting, where the chapels of printers were con traditionally controlled by older skilled men, but the women were so cut about their conditions, they were far more militant than the printers, and the printers' union, which they were a member of, was a quite militant union. The women went out, which dragged the printers' chapels out, which shut down all of the major newspapers in Sydney. And the major newspapers tried to produce a single newspaper using staff. So staff are those people who are paid so much more than anybody else 
and are on a contract where they can't join a union. Think of sub-editors, editors, HR people in today's kind of terms, the managers themselves. They tried to produce the paper using staff labour, but get the journalists to still write articles for it. And the journalists said, I don't work for the Sydney Morning Herald slash Daily Telegraph slash this slash that slash the other. I work for the Sydney Morning Herald. I work for the Daily Telegraph. I'm not going to offer my labour for this sudden new employer. I'm not obliged to. And they phrased it that they weren't taking a strike, but really they were. Um, and what happened was a bunch of the young radical CPA and ALP individuals had taken over the Sydney branch. Um, the CPA guys weren't that efficient. They don't turn up to all the meetings. But there was this vibe where the CPA and ALP cooperate, and they put out a newspaper using the CPA's official newspaper, but produced by the journalists. And the next day, the ALP wanted to get on the act, and the next day's newspaper was produced by the ALP. And on the third day, they produced their own newspaper using... Um, the newsletter printery, which to my understanding was a CPA press which mostly published racing guides. So they produced it for about two weeks and the railway men refused to move the combined Sydney Morning Herald, Daily Telegraph, this, that and the other, whereas they moved the workers' newspaper, um, the news, throughout New South Wales. And similarly, massive, massive militant workshops like Everly or Cockatoo Island or Mort's Dock, would not touch the scab paper but would buy the news. And they'll make a profit on it. That was great. And then the newspaper owners give in under government pressure and the journalists and printers go to the ALP and say, can we please have the newsprint to continue this successful profit-making workers' cooperative newspaper? Nope. And then they go back in 1945. Can we have the paper to do this again? Nope. 1946, can we have paper again? 1947, can we have paper? All they want is the newsprint itself, and the federal ALP government refused it to them. It's worth saying, sorry, there were shortages, which is why they needed to ask the government for the yeah, paper. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the ALP section of the union movement wasn't slack either. Like, state governments which were ALP in Queensland and New South Wales, despite comparative conservatism or less conservatism, did expand national industries dramatically, and they did coordinate capitalism on its own part. Um, look, it's, it's so much so that the Catholic right, which was organising in this period, was scared of socialism happening. And the ALP right in the union movement is talking about, are we ready for socialism? Are we the people who can administer it for ourselves? And this guy isn't talking about nationalisation. He's talking about bureaucratic workers' control. It's not talking about Democrat workers' control. And this is from an ALP right in 1944 in the official ALP newspaper in New South Wales. So society in general was radicalising, even if the organisations involved weren't keeping up with society's radicalisation. The ALP government itself looked forward to a program of social wage and nationalisations with wage restraint, which sounds amazingly familiar in the ideology of labourism. Um, and the CPA was actually allowed to continue limited social struggle alongside the ALP. I mean, part of this was an international belief in the communist movement that another war was coming. And now, admittedly, in 45-46, there was a short period of straight-out social peace and cooperation by the CPA where they did shed some of their more radical shop floor looser members but they came around to militancy and in part were driven there, whipped there by the working class itself who kept the fight up because with the end of the war, as typical in a commodity economy like Australia, recession came. US capital shifted from investing in Australia to investing in Europe and the United States itself, of course. Capital for Australia dried up, leaving war debts and cheap wool and wheat happened. So Australia's war economy was predicated not only on internal investment and in coal, but also on the export of high-priced wool and wheat. And the price drops and the economy goes into the arse. Now, it doesn't go into the arse as bad as it did at the end of the First World War, because international capitalism had gotten far smarter because of the Soviet Union existing, and they tried to coordinate things so white nations wouldn't suffer massive financial disruptions. But there still was a recession, and the Labor Party's 
attempt to deal with this was predicated on what happened to Lang Labor in New South Wales, where international credit was withheld from a Labor government during a depression. They wanted to control the credit structure and they also wanted to keep up the limitations on Labor militancy that had happened during the war, the limitations on capital that had happened during the war, and plan capital through a national parliament better than capital could plan itself. And what this meant was they had to fight the doctors and they had to fight the banks. They had to fight the doctors over health and the doctors organised one of the most monstrous pickets by a group of people in private practice and to a small extent employment that ever happened through the British Medical Association which is now the Australian Medical Association. And it was effective to a certain extent but Labor got the majority of Australians to vote for its constitutional amendments to allow its pharmaceutical scheme, pharmaceutical scheme through. They thought they could do the same with the banks, take on big capital again and win. Well, the doctors aren't big capital. What the banks did was the banks organised all their white-collar employees who were on the whole staff in this period. The proletarianisation was still ongoing in banking as the banking system expanded dramatically into associations to inflame the nation to write about how bad this communism was going to be because that's terms they viewed it in. There's a slippage between socialism and labour and communism on the right that's happening. And the right is starting to get the working class organised. So this is the far Protestant right in the banks primarily, organising against the ALP and the CPA, who they view as separate but they kind of propagandise that it's all one thing together. And it gets pushed to a shove and the ALP loses it. But before we get there, we have to deal with some other pushes and shoves because this is more a fight between two bunches of capitalists, ALP lead bureaucrats and the banking sector. And before we jump off from this, it's also important to note that the ALP was setting up actual, actually useful things that people wanted, like the snowy hydro to resolve water issues for capitalism and electricity issues for capitalism. Stuff that the eventual Liberal government ended up implementing anyway. And it's also worth saying that the other section of this reorganisation on the Protestant right is Menzies' formation of the Liberal Party of Australia up to 1944, where instead of a ratbag bunch of idiots brought together with a fragment of the Labor Party who were splitting rats, Menzies reorganises the Tories and the Liberals on the right in Australia into a party modelled on the ALP membership basis. And he has 15,000 members, as many members as the CPA could boast of. Now, CPA members and Liberal Party members are very different people in terms of their commitment to organise, but we'll deal with the class composition of the CPA at the end of the war period shortly. The other group who were on the fight was the Catholic section of the Labor movement, which from the early 1930s had realised that they had to change their tactics. The, the Catholic Church had conservatised in Australia since the days when it opposed the war and was basically an adjunct of working class Irish nationalism to a certain extent. And the Catholic Church that is significant here is organised around B.A. Santa Maria, a very right wing Catholic, and it's organised around the takeover of existing communist and Labor Party organisations at a workplace level, the industrial groups. The industrial groups were set up by the communists to be basically a way of coordinating an oppositional movement in unions from the outside, but not bound to the party as closely as the militant minority movement had been in the early 30s. And they got took over successfully by the Catholics and formed a real power basis for a Catholic right wing that by the end of this session, we'll look at what that results in. Now, it's also important to note that the Catholic right-wingers and the CPA on the left and the left and right factions of the ALP are fighting in unions. Unions are democratic spaces to a much greater extent than we know today. And even though the CPA tried to close down the variety of union life by making their unions tighter and more top-down, you could take over a union by being in there for 15 years and winning over local workers. But this is in a period of union growth, when you have to win workers to the union and you are winning them and then you win people to different politics. 
And just before we move on from the effects of an ALP government, the last thing the ALP government does before it's dismissed is organise ASIO. And ASIO was organised illegally. There was not the power to allow government to form this organisation. And it's also worth, spell, worth mentioning, organisation was misspelt. It was spelt in the American fashion. They corrected that when ASIO came above ground, but by 1949, the secret section of the post office and the special branches have been organised into ASIO to meet Australia's international anti-communist obligations. Now, what did the left of the working class itself want in this period? Now, look, honestly, they wanted more of the war period. The war period was a time of guaranteed full employment where you didn't have to rely on parliament to get full employment. Everything in the war period was happening stronger, harder, faster, and more towards this kind of dream that the left of the working class shared of something which was socialism or communism, but in practice for the day-to-day -day rank and file active worker meant something along the lines of nationalisation plus job control plus a regulated consumer experience that was so regulated to be radically different to what we think of. Now, the effect of this was a growing strike wave from 1942 on a consistent basis. And before I get there, I'm going to quote out of a couple of books. One of the strike waves was organised by Nick Oroglass, whose biography is written by Hal Greenland, who some people might know from the New South Wales Greens at the moment, and is called Red Hot. Nick was a very tetchy Trotskyite from Balmain who was organising out at Mort's Island and Cockatoo Dock. And workers didn't love this war. They didn't love the idea of it. But they certainly loved the wages and conditions and the ability to strike. And Balmain struck more than the Communist Party ever wanted them to because of people like Nick Oroglass activating the possibility within the working class in general. He, he was a ten guys in a dog style outfit, so it's not him doing it. And he was a tetchy bastard. He could work with people, but he was also tetchy. So it isn't some genius of organisation creating this militancy in Balmain. It's workers themselves, and they've got methods. They've got local union shops to kick things off. And they've got people like Nick telling them they deserve more one of the most revolutionary demands. The other two books I'm going to talk about and quote from briefly... Yeah. One is Robin Galland's Revolutionaries and Reformists, which, to my knowledge, isn't currently available online. And I just want to give you um, a little taste of the Labor Party's vision for socialism. Um, the Department of Post-War Reconstruction and Treasury were centres of post-war planning. Um, they had a number of subsections and committees, but chiefly the ALP leader saw the solution to the transition out of the war as full employment plus the progressive development of a national welfare fund, i.e. a social wage effectively. Um, until it was fully operative, they'd go after immediate action areas. Widows' pensions in 42, maternity benefits for Aboriginal mothers in 42, reciprocity with New Zealand in old age and invalid pensions 43, funeral benefits 43, another maternity benefit 43, unemployment and sickness benefits 44, pharmaceutical benefits, the fight they had with the doctors from 44, hospital benefits 45, another fight with the doctors, tuberculosis benefits 45, and a Commonwealth Employment Service to better organise the working class to be prepared to work. The other one which I'd like to read briefly before moving on is from Tom O'Lincoln's Into the Mainstream, The Decline of Australian Communism, which is available online at marxist.org, I've discovered. Um, and what I wanted to talk about here was the state of the Communist Party. Now, his numbers are different from the other numbers I've seen. He quotes um, 16,000 members in 1945, declining to um, 13,500 in 1946. Now, while they're up to about 23,000 during the war, it's important to 
point to two different types of Communist Party members who were war-related. So you get a lot of Communist Party members from the working class, from Everly Railway Workshop, from steel and metal, from docks, from mines, who join on the same basis that people had joined in the 1930s. But you also get people joining on a war basis because of the glorious Soviet Union's fight for democracy and freedom in Europe. These people are, and I'll quote here, artificial and largely among the middle classes. These are the stipended performing artists and fine artists. These are the university and um, better off private school teachers. These are communist doctors who all joined during the war because of the war. And they didn't have a very deep communism. The other group who joined during the war who didn't have a very deep communism but had a very different class background joined during the war on a war basis were servicemen. And they were primarily more working class. So that's the Communist Party and the ALP just at the end of the war. And what kicks off is big strikes like Nicaraglass in Balmain and strikes all over the bloody place, growing and growing through 45 and 46 and even into 47 growing. And then they start declining. And when they start declining is when the labour movement actually starts kicking hard and fast. Um, and to quote from Mark Gillespie, working for Solidarity, published in their newspaper online, on the 1948 um, railway strike in Queensland, there'd been fights in 47, but 48 is when it goes, when the Labor government, who was a conservative Labor government, who wanted Queensland to be a low-wage state, despite much more kind of farmers' association control type nationalisations in Queensland. Um, the 48, this is quoting directly, the 48 Labor government of Hanlon had followed a deliberate policy to keep Queensland a low wage state, to boost profits and to attract investment to Queensland and keep down wage costs for the government itself, a major employer. What, once on strike, the rail workers found out just how brutal a Labor government could be but the workers responded to each wave of repression by widening the dispute, eventually winning an outright victory. The outcome of the dispute was not a foregone conclusion. The study of the 48 rail strike is also a story of breaking bad laws, and the political party played by Communist Party and rank-and-file militants in shaping strategy and tactics of the strike. Now, the strike committee stuff we all know about, but massive police repression was used by a Labor government against striking workers. Not the coordination of the war years where we all sort it out, but massive, straight-out police repression. And it comes on the next year in coal in 1949. Now, coal miners had been the guts of the militancy of the non-doc section of the communist union movement. In 1946, when it's typical to see half of Trades Hall being communist or communist aligned and the other half being ALP right and ALP centre and ALP lefts who aren't willing to do the deals. This is the period where coal keeps fighting and keeps striking, but 1949 they were trying to resolve stuff which had happened earlier over hours and wages, and ordinary militant workers in the local pit organisations, the lodges, were forcing the CPA into this strike whether they liked it or not. Now, it is also important to mention that by 1949, the CPA's official position was to fight groups like the ALP out. But whether the CPA wanted it or not, the miners wanted this strike. Um, they organised really well for it. They had much advance notice that it was coming whether they liked it or not. But there was no way they couldn't have taken the strike. And it's also important to note that striking in coal would shut down Australia. This is a political kind of strike. <laughs> that takes Australian capitalism to the point where either the union has to be crushed or the union has to win. Now, whether this is politic or not is another question. Perhaps we can discuss it. But the miners on the ground were doing it regardless. I'm going to summarise briefly from Wikipedia because there's a reasonably good article. From 27 June to 15 August, so in the arse end of winter, Great time to take a coal strike, unlike what happened in Britain in the 80s. Troops were sent in by the Chifley government um, into the open-cut coal mines, I believe, to do the work rather than shoot workers. And the miners largely lost. The fact that even the CPA and the miners put 
put a demand to the government that the government would have agreed to, which Wikipedia sources to a dead link, but I think it's reasonable to assume that the miners actually wanted to get out of this strike rather than go all the way, the, the government wanted to crush them. Just as an election was coming up, just as bank nationalisation was being fought with the white collar yellow dog unions organised by the banks. And look, this is a story of state persecution. Two, two days after the strike, the government made it illegal to give strikers and their families financial support, including shop credit, which was very important for working class families. Union officials were ordered to hand over funds. The head of the CPA was imprisoned pretty much immediately. Um, Corwell threatened to put communists and their sympathisers into concentration camps and um, soldiers commenced mining the pits. And the only unions on side were the CPA unions, which is very different to the 44 journalist strike. So something has broken down in the labour movement over these four years post-war. And this, this is, I think, what we need to talk about amongst ourselves. Because labour, the nationalisation of capitalism, socialists in parliament lost their fight with capitalism. And the Menzies government was returned, and Menzies did exactly what Labor was doing prior to Labor's election, more or less. Try and manage capitalism better than it could bloody manage itself. People forget that Menzies made university free for workers for the first time through scholarship systems. Menzies vastly increased a whole bunch of industries on the basis of government funds. Menzies didn't attack full employment. But Menzies was returned to power. It's worth talking about the way in which the working class was divided just briefly before I finish because I know that I'm running long here. So, the CPA were declared illegal in peacetime after Menzies came to power and the best parts of the ALP fought against that and they won but the union movement was still broken and it was broken into these divisions. The Catholic right who feared communism and socialism but wanted a kind of national social wage but much less regulation of capitalism. The ALP right, who'd lost any sense of impending socialism in this period of time. The ALP left, who were less and less cooperating with the communists. The CPA itself, who felt like they'd fucked up the coal strike big time. Whether they had or not, this was the feeling people walked away from it with, and they lost a shitload of middle-class members over it, which in an organisation that's membership-based is a sign to you that you're failing, even if you've lost the right kind of member. Wage restraint became official government policy. The ALP was broken into three factions, one of whom was soon to leave the ALP in Victoria and scab on them consistently. The CPA was broken as a militant, near-revolutionary force and began shending members like crazy under state persecution. The Catholics broke union solidarity in the parliamentary ALP. Nationalisation of capitalism proved impossible for the ALP. Revolution failed. There's a fourth group of... Not fourth group, a fifth group of workers which we haven't talked about, who Menzies appealed to, who are the forgotten people, who we'll deal with next week. Non-unionised workers. And perhaps had these workers been unionised and incorporated, we could have done better. But let's reverse this and end on a win. For 10 years, the labour movement at the highest level was broadly united and united top down and bottom up over broadly agreed conceptions of something which people would broadly call socialism. They disagreed on what that meant, but you know, you could talk social socialism and people would be on side. The working class movement immediately increased the quality of work and cash money value of wages during the war. Unions grew stronger, unions fought more. State socialists tried nationalisation within capitalism. The ALP had not tried this prior to now in any serious sense other than sewer socialism, which means building sewerage lines at a state level. And they weren't defeated by a credit squeeze like Lang was. They had to be defeated by an out-and-out organised and, out and mobilising social movement and a reorganised Tory and Liberal grouping, which basically organised their party using Labor's techniques. The revolutionary socialists had democratically listened to mass demands from below for 10 years and had won people to them. 
more and more and greater and greater. And look, despite Stalinism, most of the Communist Party who were workers kept faith with the workers around them and faith with the concept of a worker-centred revolution. And the workers forced them to bloody try it on in a mass way, in a way in which even Stalinists could not avoid. And through imperialism and war, perhaps, which demanded that capitalism actually produce useful things, we broke unemployment and job hunger for 30 years. Full employment became the policy of both groups who managed capitalism in Australia. People would never have to walk the track again in the same old way. So next week, let's deal next week with the right wing of the working class with wage determination again. Yeah, I know it's boring, but we're going to talk about militant blue-collar unions using wage determination to try and pull the rest of the working class up in a climate where other unions would not fight. And the post-war boom and the overcoming of wage and price limitations at the end of the period. So let's have questions and discussion, but let me just finish the recording before we begin that. Thank you all.